that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold a swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, would famine, sword and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France, or may we cram within this wooden O, the very cast they did affright the air at Agincourt. On your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high uprearied and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. For it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping our times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray. Gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. My lord, I'll tell you. That same bill is urged, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was likely to have been against us fast, but that the scambling and unquiet times did push it out of further question. But how, my lord, shall we resist it now? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. For all those temporal lands which men devout my testament have given to the church, would they strip from us? Thus runs the bill. This would drink deep. It would drink the cup and all. But what prevention? The king is full of grace and fair regard. And a true lover of the holy church. The causes of his youth promised it not, since his addiction was to causes vain, his companies unlettered, rude and shallow, his hours filled up with banquets, riots, sports, and never noted in him any study. And so the prince obscured his contemplations under the veil of wildness, which grew, no doubt, like the summer grass, fastest by night. <laughs> the breath no sooner left his father's body, but that the wildness mortified in him seemed to die too. Sir John Falstaff <laughs> and all his company along with him, he vanished. Oh. Under pain of death, not to come near his person by ten miles. Yea, at that very moment, consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood as in this king. We are blessed in the change. We are blessed in the change! <laughs> My good lord, how now for mitigation of this bill urged by the commons? Doth his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon our part, for I have made an offer to his majesty as touching France to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did to his predecessor's part withal. How did this offer seem received, my lord? A 
good acceptance of his majesty, save that there was not time enough to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done, of his true title to some certain dukedoms, and generally to the crown and seat of France, derived from Edward, his great-grandfather. What was the impediment that broke this off? The French ambassador, upon that instant, craved audience. <laughs> And I think the hour is come to give him hearing. Is it four o'clock? It is. Then go we in to hear his embassy, which I could with a ready guess declare before the Frenchman speak a word of it. I'll wait upon you, and I long to hear it. Guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. Sure, we thank you. <laughs> My learned lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law salic that they have in France so should or should not bar us in our claim. We charge you in the name of God, take heed how you awake the sleeping sword of war. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood, whose guiltless drops do make such waste in brief mortality. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers, that owe your lives, your faith, your services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to France but this, which they produce from Faramont. In teram salicam mulieres ne succedat. No woman shall succeed in Salic land. Which Salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France? Yet their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic lies in Germany, between the floods of Sala and of Elf, where Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, there left behind and settled certain French, who, holding in disdain the German women for some dishonest manners of their life, <laughs> established there this law, to wit, no female should be in heretrix in Salic land, which is this day in Germany called Meisen. Then doth it well appear the Salic law was not devised for the realm of France, nor did the French possess the Salic land until 401 and 20 years after the function of King <laughs> Faramond, idly supposed the founder of this law. King Pepin, which deposed Kilderic, 
did, as our general, being descended. Uh, <laughs> Blithild. <laughs> it was daughter to <laughs> King Clothair made claim and title to the throne of France. Hugh Capet also, which usurped the crown of, of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, sole heir male of the true line and stock of <laughs> of Charles the Great could not keep quiet in his conscience, wearing the crown of France, till satisfied that fair, that fair, that fair, Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was lineal of the lady, of the lady, of the lady, of the lady Armengar, daughter to Charles, the foresaid Duke of Lorry. So that as clear as is the summer's sun, all hold in right and title of the female. So do the kings of France unto this day, albeit they would hold up this Salic law to bar your highness claiming from the female. May I, with right and conscience, make this claim. The sin upon my head, dread sovereign. For in the book of Numbers it is writ, when the son die, let the inheritance descend unto the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand your own. Look back into your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread Lord, your great grandsire's tomb from whom you claim. Invoke his warlike spirit and your great uncle's Edward the Black Prince. Your brother kings and monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace hath cause and means and might. So hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer or more loyal subjects whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, with blood and sword and fire to win your right in aid whereof we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring in to any of your ancestors. Call in the messengers sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, we'll bend it to our all. Or lay these bones in an unworthy urn, tombless with no remembrance over them. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin, for we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. May it please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge, or shall we sparingly show you, far off, the Dauphin's meaning and our embassy? We are no tyrant, but a Christian king. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus then, in few, your highness lately sending into France did claim some searching dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer to which claim, the prince our master says that you save out too much of your youth. He therefore sends you, fitter for your study, this ton of treasure. And in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazards. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well how he comes o'er us with our wilder days not measuring what use we made of them. But tell the Dauphin we will keep our estate 
Be like a king and show our sail of greatness when we do rouse us in our throne of France. And tell the pleasant prince, this mock of his hath turned these balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down. Aye, some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the dauphin's scorn. But this lies all within the will of God. To whom we do appeal, and in whose name, tell you the Dauphin, we are coming on to defend us as we may, and to perform our rightful claim in one hallowed cause, so get you hence in peace. And tell the Dauphin, his jest will savor but of shallow wit, when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. And may the wind safe conduct fare you well. was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, let our proportion for these wars be soon collected. And all things thought upon that may with reasonable swiftness add more feathers to our wings. For God before, we'll check this dolphin at his father's door. <laughs> of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armourers, and honour's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings, with winged heels as English mercuries. For now sits expectation in the air, and hides a sword from hilt unto the point with crowns imperial, crowns and coronets promised to Harry and his followers. Linger your patience on, for if we may, we'll not offend one stomach with our play. than you, friend, yet. For my part, I care not. I say little. But when time shall sell... I will bestow a breakfast to make you friends. And we'll all go three sworn brothers to France. Will it be so good, Corporal Nim? Well, I cannot tell. Oh, it is certain, Corporal. He's married to Nell quickly. And certainly she did you wrong, for you were betrothed to her. Things must be as they may. Men may sleep. Mm. They may have their throats about them at that mm. time. Some say knives have edges. Oh. Well... I cannot tell. Here comes Pistol in his way. Good cop, good cop. Be patient here. I scorn the title. <laughs> Not so my nail, keep lodger. No, Barnett's not. Not long. But we cannot lodge a board a dozen of fourteen gentlemen. 
the women that live honestly by the prick of their needles. But it'll be thought we keep a bawdy house. Right. Yeah. Oh, hound of Crete. <laughs> Fix them, I suppose, to get. <laughs> I have and I will hold my honey queen. And there's enough go to. I will prick your guts a little, and that's the truth of it. No. Oh. Well, a day, Lady Miss Love will murder and adultery committed. Good cop. Good lieutenant. Up on nothing here. Peace. Peace to the Iceland dog. Thou pricky and cur of Iceland. Good Corporal Nim, show thy valour. Put up thy sword. I will cut thy throat one time or other in fair terms. I can take. Now Pistol's cock is up and flashing fire will follow. Hear me, hear me what I say. He just strikes the first stroke. Now I run him up the hills. Now I must do the soldier. A loose of mickle might and fury shall it be. <laughs> You must come to Sir John Falstaff and you, hostess. He's very sick and would to bed. Good bard of. Put thy nose between the sheets and do the office of a warming pan. Away, you rogue! Wife, he's very ill. By me troth, the king hath killed his heart. Good husband, come home presently. Come. Shall I make you two friends? We must do France together. Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? Let's bloods or swell and fiends for food howl on. You'll pay me the eight shillings I won off you at betting. Base is the slave that paid. <laughs> now that will I have. That's the humor of it. Hell, man who shall compound, who shall buy this sword. He that makes the first thrust, I'll kill him. Sword, I will. Her sister's sword is loose, and who's must have their pants. Corporal Nim, and I will be friends, be friends. And I will not, why then be enemies with me too, pretty for that fur. Has ever you come of women? Come quickly to Sir John. He's so shaked of a burning contigian fever, it's lamentable to be old. Sweet men, come to him. The king hath run bad humours on the night. Him thou hast spoke the right. His heart is fractured and corroborate. The king is a good king, but it must be as it may. He passes some humours. Let us condole the night. For Lambkins, we will live. your patience on, and we'll digest the abuse of distance. Force a play. The king is set from London, and the scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. There is the playhouse now. There must you sit. And thence to France shall we convey you safe and bring you back, charming the narrow sea to give you gentle pass. But here, till then, unto Southampton do we change our scene. sits the wind fair. Uncle of Exeter, set free the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was the heat of wine that set him on, and on his wiser thought we pardon him. That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, Sovereign. This example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind. Oh, let us yet be merciful. We doubt not now, but every rub is smoothed on our way. 
Then forth, dear countrymen. Oh. Let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight in expedition. Cheer it to see. Oh. The signs of war advance. Oh. No king of England, if not king of France. Still be kind and eke out our performance with your mind. King Hell, my royal Hell. God save thee, my sweet boy, my king, my Joe. I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How will white hairs become a fool and jester? I have long dreamed of such a kind of man, so surfeit swell, so old and so profane. But being awake, I do despise my dream. Reply not to me with a foolish jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. So shall I those that kept me company. Honey, sweet husband, let me bring thee to Staines. No, for my manly heart doth yearn. Bar off, be blind. Nim, rouse thy vaunting veins. Boy, bristle thy courage up. For Falstaff he is dead, and we must yearn, therefore. Well, Sir John is gone. God be with him. Would I were with him, where some air he is, either in the heaven or in the hell. Nay. He's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. Made a finer end and went away, and it had been any crystal child. Parted in just betwixt twelve and one. In at the turning of the tide. When I saw him fumble with the sheets, play with flowers, smile upon his finger ends, I knew there was no way but one. But his nose was as sharp as a pen. And he babbled the green fields. How now, Sir John, quoth I? What man? Be a good cheer. So he cried out, God, 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 three or four times. Now I to comfort him, bid him he should not think on God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So he bade me lay more clothes on his feet. Put my hand in the bed and felt them. They were as cold as any stone. Then I felt to his knees. And they were as cold as any stone. And so upwards, 
and upwards. And all was cold as any stone. They cried out for sack. Aye, he did that. And for women? Aye. That he did not. Why, that he did. I... And he said they were devils incarnate. He said once the devil would have him about women. He did in some sort, indeed, handle women. But then he was rheumatic. He spoke of the whore of Babylon. Do you not remember? He saw a flea stand on Bardolph's nose and said it was a black soul burning in hellfire. Well, the fuel is gone that maintained that fire. That's all the riches I got in his service. Shall we go? The king will be gone from Southampton. Come, let us away. My love, give me thy lips. Look to my chattels and my movables. Go clear thy crystals. Yoke fellows in arms, let us to France. Like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck, the very blood to suck. Touch her soft lips and part. Farewell, hostess. Uh, I cannot kiss. That's the humor of it. But adieu. Let Hazef reappear. Keep close, I thee command. Is it not passing brave to be a king and ride in triumph through Persephone? Thus, with imagined wing, our scene flies swift as that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty and his brave fleet. Play on your fancies, and in them behold, upon the hempen tackle, ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the thread and sails, borne with the invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge vessels through the parent seas, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the shore, and then behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing, holding due course to half there. Follow, follow, and leave your England as dead midnight still guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair that will not follow these culled and choice-drawn cavaliers to France? The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy, seek to divert the English purposes. Thus comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully thus concerns to answer royally in our defences. Therefore, you dukes of Berry and of Bourbon, Lord Constable and Orleans, shall make forth, and you, Prince Dorothy. With all swift dispatch to line and new repair our towns of war with men of courage and with means defendant. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe. And let us do it with no show of fear. 
No wit no more than if we heard that England were busied with a Whitson Morris dance. For my good liege, she is so idly kinged, so guided by a shallow, humorous youth, that fear attends her not. Oh, peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. Question your grace our late ambassadors, with what great state he heard their embassy. How well supplied with aged counsellors, how terrible in constant resolution. Well, tis not so, my lord, high constable, but though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defence, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. And he is bred out of that bloody strain that halted us in our familiar paths, when Cressy battle fatally was struck and all our princes captive by the hand of that black name, Edward, Black Prince of Wales. This is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave admittance to your majesty. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. Good, my sovereign. Take up the English short and let them know of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother, England? From him. And thus he greets your majesty. He wills you, in the name of God Almighty, that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glory that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, belongs to him and to his heirs, namely the crown. Willing, you overlook this pedigree. And when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward III, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. If not, what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to. For us, we will consider this further. Uh, tomorrow shall you bear our full intent back to our brother England. For the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome, the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Thus says my king, and if your father's highness do not in grant of all demands at large sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, he'll make your Paris Louvre shake for it. Tomorrow shall you know a mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed, lest that our king come here himself to question our delay. Work, work your thoughts, and therein see a siege. To hold the ordnance on their carriages with fatal mouths gaping on girded half English 
In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood. Disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gauded rock, or hang on jutty his confounded base, swilled with a wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument, dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of growth of blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, training upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry! England and St. In bloody field, both win immortal fame. Ah, ah. It's all right, and that's the truth of it. Would I were in an ale house in London, I'd give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. I'm glad! Up to the breach, you dogs! I'm on to you, carriers! Ah. 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 Be merciful, be doomed to men of gold! Ah. A big damage! Ah, A big damage! Limble gunner with linstock now, the devilish cannon touches. And down goes all before him. Captain Fluellen! Captain Fluellen, you must come presently to the mines. The Duke of Gloucester would speak with you. To the mines? Tell you the Duke. It is not so good to come to the mines. For look you, the mines is not according to the disciplines of war. The concavities of it is not sufficient. For look you, the adversary you may discuss under the Duke, look you. He's digged himself four yards under the counter mines. <coughs> By Jehu, I think he will blow up all if there is not better directions. The Duke of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, is altogether directed by an Irishman. A very valiant gentleman, he says. Mm, it is Captain Mac Morris, is it not? I think it be. By G, he is an asset in the world. I will verify as much in his beard. He has no more directions in the true disciplines of the wars, look you, of the Roman disciplines, than is a puppy dog. <laughs> Here he comes. And the Scots captain, Captain Jamie, with him. Ah, Captain Jamie is a marvellous, valorous gentleman, that is certain, of great expeditions and knowledge in the ancient wars. <laughs> Oh, say good day, Captain Fuller. Oh, gentle, your worship, good <laughs> Captain James. <laughs> Captain Jamie is a marvellous, valorous gentleman, that is certain. <laughs> How now, Captain McMorris? Have you quit the mines? Have the pioneers given over? Oh, by the saints, tis ill done. The work is give over. The trumpets sound the retreat. By my hand, I swear, and by my father's soul, tis ill done. The work is give over. I would have blowed up the town, so God save me. In an hour! Ah, it is ill done. Why, my hand is ill done. <laughs> Captain McMorris, I beseech you now, will you vouchsafe me, look you, a few disputations with you? Uh, partly to satisfy my opinion, and partly for the satisfaction, look you, of my mind. <laughs> As touching the direction of the military disciplines, that is the point. It shall be very good, good faith, good captains both. And I would fain hear some discourse between you twain. This is no time to discourse, so God save me. No. The day is hot and the weather and the wars and the king and the dukes. This is no time to discourse. 
The town is besieged. Ah, the trumpet calls into the breach and we talk and with the holy do nothing. It is a shame for us all to God save me. It is a shame to stand still. It is a shame by me hand. And there is truth to be caught and work to be done and nothing is done, so help me God. <laughs> By the boss, ere these eyes of mine take themselves to slumber, I'll do good service. Or I'll lie the ground for it. I, or go to death. And I'll pay it as valorously as I may. That shall I surely do. That is the brief and the long of it. <clears throat> Captain McMorris, I think, look you, under your correction, there is not many of your nation. Of my nation? What is my nation? Is a villain, a bastard, and a knave, and a rascal? What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? Look you. If you take the matter otherwise than is meant, Captain McMorris, peradventure I shall think you do not use me with that affability as in discretion you ought to use me. Look, you being as good a man as yourself, both in the discipline of war and the derivation of my bath and other particularities. I do not know you as good a man as myself, so God save me and I will cut off your head. Gentlemen, both. You will mistake each other. Oh, that's a foul fault. <laughs> The town sounds a party! Hey! How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest parley we'll admit. Our expectation hath this day an end. The dolphin of whom succor we entreated returns us word his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, dread king, we yield our town and lives to your soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Open your gates. Come, Brother Gloucester. Go you and enter, Harfleur. There remain and fortify it strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear brother, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Callis. Tonight in Hafler will we be your guest. Tomorrow for the march are we addressed. Tu as été en Angleterre et tu parles bien le langage. Un peu, madame. Je te prie, monseigneur. Il faut que j'apprenne à parler. Comment appelez-vous la main en anglais? La main, elle est appelée the hand. The hand. Et les doigts? Les doigts. Oh, ma foi, j'oublie les doigts. Mais je me souviendrai. Les doigts. Ah, je pense qu'ils sont appelés the fingers. Oui, the fingers. La main de Hunt, les doigts de Fingers. Je pense que je suis le bon écolier. 
J'ai gagné deux mots d'anglais. Vite mot. Comment appelez-vous les ongles Les ongles. Nous les appelons denials. Denials. Écoutez, dites-moi si j'y parle bien. The hand, the fingers, the knife. Oh, C'est bien dit, madame. Il est fort bon anglais. Dites-moi l'anglais pour le bras. The arm, madame. Et le coude The elbow. The elbow. Je m'en fais la répétition de tous les mots que vous m'avez appris dès à présent. Oh, ça, c'est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, Alice. Écoutez. The hand, the fingers, the nails, the arm, the elbow. Sauf pour son heure, the elbow. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie. The elbow. Comment appelez-vous le col The nick. The nick. Et le menton The sin. The sin. Le col de nick, le menton qui sin. En vérité, vous prononcez les mots aussi droits que les natifs d'Angleterre. Oh, je ne doute pas d'apprendre, par la grâce de Dieu, et en peu de temps. N'avez-vous pas déjà oublié ce que je vais enseigner Non, je réciterai en vous fantôme. The hand, the fingers, the miles, the nails, madame. The nails, the arm, the elbow. The elbow. Ainsi dis-je, the elbow. The nick et the Comment appelez-vous le pied et la robe The foot et le con. Oh, Seigneur Dieu Ce sont mots de sang mauvais, corruptibles, gros et impudiques. Et non pour les dames d'honneur, tu sais. Je ne voudrais prononcer ces mots devant les seigneurs de France pour tout le monde. Oh, du foot et du con. Néanmoins, je réciterai encore une fois mes leçons ensemble. The hand, the fingers, the nails, the arm, the elbow. The nick, the sin, the foot et the con. Oh, madame, c'est excellent. <rire> c'est assez pour une fois. Allons nous à dîner. Certainly hath passed the river some. And if he be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Let us quit all and give our vineyards to a barbarous people. Normans, but bastard Normans, Norman bastard. More than a V. march along unfought with all, then I will sell my dukedom to buy a slobbery and dirty farm in that nook shot in Isle of Albion. Dear the Bataille, where have they this battle? Is not the climate foggy, raw and dull, on whom as in despite the sun looks pale, killing their fruit with frowns? And shall our quick blood, spirited with wine, seem frosty? By faith and honor, our madams mock at us, and plainly say our metal is bred out. And they will give their bodies to the lust of English youth, to new store France with bastard warriors. Where is Mount Joy, the herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Our princes and with spirit of honor is bar Harry England that sweeps through our land with pennants painted in the blood of Harfleur. Go down upon him, you have power enough, and in a captive chariot into Rouen, bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry, oh my, his numbers are so few. His soldiers sick and famished in their march. 
For I am sure when he shall see our army, he'll drop his heart into the sink of fear and for achievement offer us his ransom. Therefore, Lord Constable, haste on Mount Joy. Prince Dauphin, you shall stay with us in Rouen. Not so, I do beseech your majesty. Station, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable, and princes all, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. You know me by my habit. Well, then, I know thee. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfold it. Thus says my king. Say thou to Harry of England, though he seemed dead, we did but slumber. Tell him we could have rebuked him at Harfleur, but we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. Bid him, therefore, consider of his ransom which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested. For our losses, his exchequer is too poor. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of his kingdom, too faint a number. And for our disgrace, his own person, kneeling at our feet, but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this, add defiance. And tell him for conclusion, he hath betrayed his followers whose condemnation is pronounced. So far, my king and master. So much my office. What is thy name? I know thy quality. Mount Joy. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell thy king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. For to say the sooth, my people are with sickness much enfeebled. My numbers lessened. Go, therefore, tell thy master, here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless body. My army but a weak and sickly guard. Yet, God before, tell him we will come on, though France herself and such another neighbor stood in our way. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolor. And so, Mount Joy, fare you well. We would not seek a battle as we are. Nor as we are, we say we will not shun it. So tell your master. I shall deliver so. That's for thy labor, Mount Joy. Thanks to your highness. March to the bridge. The bridge! It now draws toward night. Beyond the river, we'll encamp ourselves. And on the morrow, bid them march away. Entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire. And through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful nays, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, the armorers, accomplishing the knights, with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice and chide the crippled, tardy, gated knight who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. Tut, I have the best armor of the world. Would it would, uh... You have an excellent armor, but let my horse have his due. It is the best horse of Europe. Hmm. 
split never be mourning. My Lord of Orleans, my Lord High Constable, you talk of horse and armor. You are as well provided of both as any prince in the world. <sighs> what a long night is this. I will not change my horse for any that treads on four hoofs. Aha, he bounds from the earth. When I bestride him, I saw I am a hawk. He trots the air, the earth sings when he touches it. He is of the color of nutmeg and of the heat of the ginger. He is pure air and fire. And all other jades you may call beasts. It is indeed, my lord, a most absolute and excellent horse. It is the prince of palfreys. His neigh is like the bidding of a monarch. And his countenance enforces homage. No more, cousin. <laughs> Nay, cousin. The man hath no wit that cannot, from the rising of the lark to the lodging of the lamb, very deserved praise on my palfrey. I once writ a sonnet in his praise, and began thus. Wonder of nature... I have heard a sonnet begin so to one's mistress. Then did they imitate that which I composed to my courser, for my horse is my mistress. Methought yesterday your mistress shrewdly shook your back. My Lord Constable, the armor that I see in your tent tonight, are those stars or suns upon it? Stars, my lord. Some of them will fall tomorrow, I hope. That may be. Will it never be day? I will trot tomorrow a mile, and my way shall be paved with English faces. Who'll go hazard with me for twenty prisoners? It is midnight. I'll go arm myself. Huh. The dolphin longs for morning. <laughs> he longs to eat the English. I think he will eat all he kills. <laughs> he never did harm that I heard of. Nor will do none tomorrow. He'll keep that good name still. I know him to be valiant. I was told that by one that knows him better than you. What's he? Mary, he told me so himself. <laughs> and he said he cared not who knew him. The Lord High Constable, the English lie within 1,500 paces of your tents. Who hath measured the ground? The Lord Grand Prix. A valiant and most expert gentleman. <laughs> what it were day. Alas, poor Harry of England. He longs not for the dawning as we do. <laughs> what a wretched and peevish fellow is this King of England to mope with his fat-brained followers so far out of his knowledge. If the English had any apprehension, they'd run away. That they lack. For if their heads had any intellectual armor, they could never wear such heavy headpieces. <laughs> That island of England breeds very valiant creatures. Their mastiffs are of unmatchable courage. They're foolish curs that run winking into the mouth of a Russian bear and have their heads crushed like rotten apples. You may as well say, that's a valiant flea that dare eat his breakfast on the lip of a lion. Just, just. And the men are like the mastiffs. Give them great meals of beef and iron and steel. They'll eat like wolves and fight like devils. <laughs> but these English are shrewdly out of beef. Hmm. Then shall we find tomorrow they've only stomachs to eat and none to fight. <laughs> hmm. Now is it time to arm? Come, shall we about it? It is now two o'clock. But let me see, by ten, we shall have each a hundred Englishmen. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. The poor condemned English, like sacrifices by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger, and their gesture sad, investing lank lean cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon, so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now, 
Who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. A large S universal like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to everyone, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all, behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. Gloucester, it is true that we are in great danger. The greater, therefore, should our courage be. Good morrow, old Sir Thomas Elpingham. A good soft pillow for that good white head were better than a churlish turf of France. Not so, my liege. This lodging suits me better. Since I may say, now lie I like a king. <laughs> <laughs> Lend me thy cloak, Sir Thomas. I and my bosom must debate a while, and then I would no other company. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Harry. God of mercy, old heart. Kivara! A friend. Discuss unto me. Art thou officer? Or art thou base, common, and popular? I am a gentleman of a company. Trailst thou the puissant pike? Even so, what are you? Huh. As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you are better than the king. Ah, the king's a borecock and a heart of gold. A lad of life, an imp of fame. Of parents good, of fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe, and from heart's string I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Henry Leroy. Leroy. A Cornish name, art thou of Cornish crew? No, I'm a Welshman. Knowst thou Fluellen? Yes. Art thou his friend? Aye, and his kinsman too. But tell him I'll knock his leek about his head upon St. David's Day. Do not you wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours. A figo for thee then. I thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol Corp. It sorts well with your fierceness. Captain Flewellyn! In the name of Beelzebub, speak lower. If you will take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, there is no tittle tattle nor people pabble in Pompey's camp. I warrant you shall find the ceremonies of the wars and the cares of it and the forms of it to be otherwise. Why, the enemy is loud. You can hear him all night. If the enemy is an ass, and a fool, and a prating coxcomb. Is it me to think you that we should also look you be an ass, and a fool, and a prating coxcomb? In your own conscience now? I will speak lower. I pray you, and beseech you that you will. Though it appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valour in this Welshman. Brother John Bates, be not that the morning which breaks yonder. I think it be. 
that we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under uh, Sir Thomas Effingham. Oh. Good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that looked to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told his thought to the king. No. Nor it is not meet he should. For I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it does to me. His ceremony is laid by, in his nakedness he appears but a man. Therefore, when he sees reasons of fears as we do, his fears without doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet no man should find in him any appearance of fear, lest he by showing it should dishearten his army. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe as cold and nice it is, wish himself in Thames up to the neck. So I would he were, and I'd buy him at all adventures, so he were quit here. By my troth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were here alone. So should he be sure to be ransomed, and a many poor men's lives saved. Methinks I would not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. His cause being just, and his quarrel honorable. It's more than we know. Aye. Or more than we should seek after. But we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make when all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle shall join together at the latter day and cry all, we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children rawly left. I'm afraid there are few die well that die in a battle. For how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it'll be a black matter for the king that led them to it. Mm. Aye. So. If a son that is by his father sent upon merchandise to sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father that sent him. But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer for the particular endings of his soldiers, nor the father of his son. For they purpose not their deaths when they purpose their services. Every subject's duty is the king but every subject's soul is his own. It is certain. Every man that dies ill, ill's on his own head. The king's not to answer for it. Oh, I do not desire he should answer for me. And yet I determine to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. <laughs> he said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed and we ne'er the wiser. If I live to see it, I'll never trust his word after. <laughs> That's a perilous shot out of a pop gun. But a poor and private displeasure can do against a monarch. You may as well go about to turn the sun to ice with fanning in its face with a peacock's feather. You'll never trust his word after. Come, tis a foolish saying. Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you if the time are convenient. Let it be a quarrel between us then, if you live. Be friends, you English fools, be friends. We have French quarrels enough, if you could tell how to reckon. Upon the king.
Let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. What infinite heart's ease must kings forego that private men enjoy? And what have kings that privates have not too, save ceremony? And what art thou, thou idle ceremony, that sufferest more of mortal griefs than do thy worshippers? What drinks thou oft, instead of homage sweet, but poisoned flattery? Oh, be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Canst thou, when thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it? No, thou proud dream that placed so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the orb and scepter, crown imperial, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. Not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave, who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night the child of hell, but like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Elysium. Next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse, and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labor to his grave. And but for ceremony, such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand and vantage of a king. My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through your camp to find you. Good old night. God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts, possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning, lest the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. My lord. My lord, the army stays upon your presence. I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day 
my friends, and all things stay for me. himself is road to view their battle. The fighting men, they have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Besides, they all are fresh. God's arm strike with us is a fearful odds. Well, God with you, Prince, is all out of my charge. If we no more meet till we meet in heaven, then joyfully, my noble Westmoreland, my dear Lord Gloucester, my good Lord Exeter, and my kind kinsmen, warriors all, adieu. Farewell, good soul, Brett. And good luck go with thee. Farewell, kind Lord. Oh, that we now had here, but one ten thousand of those men in England that do not work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this feast, let him depart. His passport shall be drawn and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin say, old men forget. Yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the end of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so base. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. <laughs> Off with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedience charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Finish the man whose mind is backward now. Thou dost not wish more help from England, cuz? God's will, my liege. Would you and I alone without more help could fight this battle out? You know your places. God be with you all. <laughs>
Once more I come to know of thee, King Harry, if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow. Who hath sent thee now? The Constable of France. I pray thee bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Good God, why should they mock poor fellows thus? The man that once did sell the lion's skin while the beast lived was killed with hunting him. And many of our bodies shall no doubt find native graves, upon the which I trust shall witness live in brass of this day's work. And those that leave their valiant bones in France, dying like men, though buried in your dunghills, they shall be famed. For there the sun shall greet them and draw their honors reeking up to heaven, leaving their earthly parts to choke your climb. The smell whereof shall breed a plague in France. Let me speak proudly. Tell the constable we are but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. And time hath worn us into slavery. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. Aye. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shall have none, I swear, but these my bones, which if they have as I will leave them them, shall yield them little. Tell the constable. I shall, King Harry, and so fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear Herald any more. Now, soldiers, march away! And how thou pleasest God to dispose the day.
countrymen, but all's not done yet. Keep the French the field. Shame on the eternal shame, nothing but shame. Let's die in honor once more back again. We are not yet living in the field to smother up the English in our throngs if any order might be thought about. The devil take order now, while to the throng. Let life be short, else shame will be too long. Blood. Kill the boys and the luggage. <laughs> Tis expressly against the law of arms. <laughs> Is as arrogant a piece of naval remark you now as can be offered? In your conscience now, is it not? Tis certain there's not a boy left alive. And the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle have done this slaughter. Here comes His Majesty. I was not angry since I came to France, until this instant.
His eyes are humbler than they used to be. Hearts will. What means this, Herald? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander o'er this bloody field to book our dead, and then to bury them. The day is yours. Praise it be God, and not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? We call it Agincourt. And call we this the field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin Crispian. the number of the slaughtered French. This note doth tell me of 10,000 French that in the field I slain. Where is the number of our English dead? Edward, the Duke of York. The Earl of Suffolk. Sir Richard Ketley. Davy Gam, Esquire and of all other men, but five and twenty score. O oh God, thy arm was here. Tis wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village. Let there be sung non nobis and te deum. The dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then to Calais, and to England then. Where ne'er from France arrived more happier men. Where you your leak today? St. Davy's day is past. There is occasions and causes why and wherefore in all things, Captain Gower. I will tell you as my friend, Captain Gower. The rascally, beggarly, lousy knave pistol, which you and yourself and all the world know to be no better than a fellow, look you, of no merits. He has come to me and bring me bread and salt yesterday, look you, and bid me eat my leak. <laughs> 
was in a place where I could not breed no contention with him. But I will be so bold as were it in my cap till I see him once again. <laughs> and then I will tell him a little piece of my desires. <laughs> Why, it is a gull, a fool, a rogue, that now and then goes to the walls to grace himself at his return into London under the form of a soldier. <laughs> and what such as the camp can do among foaming bottles and ale-washed wits is wonderful to be thought of. <laughs> Here he comes, swelling like a turkey cock. It is no matter for his swellings, nor his turkey cocks. God bless you, Pistol, you scurvy, lousy knave. God bless you. Ha! Art thou bedlam? Hence! I am quarished at the smell of leek. I beseech you heartily, scurvy, lousy knave, to eat, look you, this leek. Mm. Not for Cadwallader and all his goats. There is one goat for you. Will you be so good as eat it? Bestrosion! Thou shalt die! You say very true when God's will is. Holy. I will desire you to live in the meantime and eat your victuals. Come, there is sauce for it! Oh, yeah. You can mock the leaf, you can eat the leaf. Bite, I pray you. Thou shalt fight. Out of doubt and out of question, too. By this leaf, I will most horribly revenge. I eat. I eat. I eat. Nay, pray you. Thrown on away. The skin is good for your broken coxcomb. <coughs> when you take occasions to see leeks hereafter, I pray you mock at him, that is all. Good. Aye, oh. leeks is good. <laughs> Hold you. Here is a penny to heal your head. Me a penny? Yes, verily, and in truth you shall take it, or I have another leek in my pocket which you shall eat. God buy you and keep you and heal your head. All hell shall stir for this go to. You are a counterfeit cowardly knave. You thought because he could not speak English in the native garb that he therefore could not handle an English cudgel. But you find it otherwise. And henceforth, let a Welsh correction teach you a good English condition. Fare ye well. <laughs> Doth fortune play the strumpet with me now? News have I that my nail lies dead in the hospital of the malady of France. And there my rendezvous is quite cut off. Old do I wax, and from my weary limbs honor is cut. Well, bored I'll turn, and something lean to cut purse of quick hand. To England will I steal, and there I'll steal, and patches will I get under these scars, and swear I got them in these present walls. <laughs> and to our sister, health and fair time of day. Joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin, Catherine. And as a branch or member of this royalty, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy, and princes French and peers. Health to you all. 
Right joyous are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England, fairly met. Uh, so are you princes English, every one. So happy be the issue, brother England, of this good day and of this gracious meeting, as we are now glad to behold your eyes. Your eyes which hitherto were borne in them against the French that met them in their bent the fatal balls of murdering battles. The venom of such looks, we fairly hope, have lost their quality, and that this day shall change all griefs and quarrels into love. To cry amen to that, thus we appear. My duty to you both, unequal love, great kings of France and England. Since that my office hath so far prevailed that face to face and royal eye to eye you have assembled, let it not disgrace me if I demand before this royal view why that the naked, poor, and mangled peace, dear nurse of arts, of plenties, and of joyful births, should not in this best garden of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie on heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. Her vine, the merry cheerer of the heart, unpruned, dies. Her hedges, even pleached, put forth disordered twigs. Her fallow lees, the darnel, hemlock, and rank fumitory doth root upon, while that the coulter rusts that should deracinate such savagery. The even mead, but erst brought sweetly forth the freckled cowslip, burnet, and green clover. Wanting the scythe, all uncorrected, rank, conceives by idleness. And nothing teems but hateful docks, rough thistles, kexes, burrs, losing both beauty and utility. Even so our houses and ourselves and children have lost, or do not learn for want of time, the sciences that should become our country, but grow like savages, as soldiers will, that nothing do but meditate on blood, to swearing and stern looks, diffused attire, and everything that seems unnatural, which to reduce into her former favor, you are assembled. Then, Duke of Burgundy, you must gain that peace with full accord to all our just demands. I have but with a cursory eye or glance the articles. Pleaseth your grace to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us. We will suddenly pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother, we shall. Will you, fair sister, go with the princes? Or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Haply a woman's voice may do some good when articles too nicely urged be stood on. Yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She hath good leave. Safe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter at a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your Majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. Oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi. I cannot tell what is like me. <laughs> An angel is like you, Kate. 
And you are like an angel. Dit-il que je suis un de les anges Oui, vraiment, sans pas de grâce ainsi, dit-il. Oh, mon Dieu Les langues des hommes sont pleines de tromperies. What says she, fair one, that the tongues of men are full of deceits? Oui, that the tongues of the men is be full of deceits. <laughs> Faith, Kate, I am glad thou can speak no better English. For if thou couldst, thou wouldst find me such a plain king that thou wouldst think that I had sold my farm to buy my crown. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say, I love you. Give me your answer if faith do, and so clap hands in a bargain. How say you, lady? So for the honor, me understand well. Mary, if you put me to verses or to dance for your sake, Kate, why you undo me? If I might buffet for my love or bound my horse for her favors, I could lay on like a butcher and sit like a jackanapes, never off. But before God, Kate, I cannot look greenly nor gasp out my eloquence. Nor have I no cunning in protestation. If thou canst love a fellow of this temper, Kate, that never looks in his glass for the love of anything he sees there, whose face is not worth sunburning, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true. But for thy love, by the Lord, no. Yet I love thee too. And while thou livest, dear Kate, take a fellow of plain constancy. For these fellows of infinite tongue that can rhyme themselves into ladies' favors, they do always reason themselves out again. A speaker is but a prater. A rhyme is but a ballad. A straight back will stoop, a black beard will turn white, a fair face will wither, a full eye will wax hollow, but a good heart, Kate, is the sun and the moon. If thou wouldst have such a one, take me. And take me, take a soldier. Take a soldier, take a king. And what sayest thou then to my love? Speak, my fair, and fairly, I pray thee. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No, Kate, but in loving me, you would love the friend of France, for I love France so well that I will not part with the village of it. <laughs> and Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. <laughs> no, Kate. I will tell thee in French, which I am sure will hang upon my tongue like a newly married wife about her husband's neck. Hardly to be shook off. Uh, je. <laughs> Quand sur la possession de France, Et quand vous avez la possession de moi. Uh, donc, votre France et vous êtes mienne. <laughs> <laughs> I shall never move thee in French unless it be to laugh at me. Pour votre honneur, le français que vous parlez est meilleur que l'anglais que je parle. No, if fate is not, Kate. Thy speaking of my tongue and I thine must needs be granted to be much alike. But, Kate, Dost thou understand thus much English? Canst thou love me? I cannot tell. Many of your neighbors tell, Kate. I'll ask them. <laughs> Come. I know thou lovest me. And at night, when you are coming to your chamber, you will question this gentlewoman about me. And I know, Kate, you will to her dispraise those parts in me which you love with your heart. But, good Kate, mock me mercifully. The rather gentle princess, because I love thee cruelly. What sayest thou, my fair flower de luce? La plus belle Catherine du monde. Mon très cher et divine déesse. 
Your Majesty a be forced bent enough to deceive the most sage demoiselle that is en France. <laughs> now fie upon my false French, but by mine honor in true English, I love thee, Kate. By which honor, though I dare not swear, thou lovest me, yet my blood begins to flatter me thou dost. Put off your maiden blushes. Avouch the thoughts of your heart with the looks of an empress. Take me by the hand and say, Harry of England, I am thine. Which word thou shalt no sooner bless mine ear with all, but I will tell thee aloud. England is thine, Ireland is thine, France is thine, and Henry Plantagenet is thine. Therefore, queen of all, Catherine, break thy mind to me in broken English. Wilt thou have me? That is as it shall please the roi mon père. Nay, it shall please him well, Kate. It shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Ah, upon that I kiss your hand and call you my queen. Oh, laissez, Monseigneur, laissez, laissez! Ma foi, je ne veux pas vous abaisser votre grandeur en baisant les mains d'une votre indigne serviteur. Excusez-moi, je vous supplie, mon tout puissant Seigneur. Oh. Then I will kiss your lips, Kate. Oh! Tu t'aimes cette demoiselle pour être baisée devant le nom, ce n'est pas le coutume en France. Madam, I interpreter, what says she? That it is not the fashion for the ladies of France. Oh, I cannot tell what is busy in English. To kiss? Votre Majesty entendre better que moi. It is not the fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married, would she say? Oui, vraiment. Oh, Kate. Nice customs, courtesy to great kings. Dear Kate, you and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate. Therefore, patiently and yielding. You have witchcraft in your lips. God save your majesty, my royal cousin. Teach you our princess English. <laughs> I would have her learn, my fair cousin, how perfectly I love her. And that is good English. <laughs> Shall Kate be my wife? Take her, fair son, that the contending kingdoms of France and England, whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, may cease their hatred and never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. Amen. Amen.
mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small most greatly lived this star of England. Fortune made his sword, and for his sake, in your fair minds, let this acceptance take. to 5-14 and we think they've got the breeze in the last quarter. Brisbane going for top place. Secured a thrashing Adelaide. 13-18 to 8-8. They lead by 40 points. Everett's got four. Lowe's got three and Moderna's got three for the Crows. What about this out of bounds on the four? What do you think, Jared? A second, a second look? Well, initially it, uh, it did look as if it was over the line. Oh, it might have hit the line there. Look. Well, I think when it's a oh. close ball like that, you'd probably go with the umpire. But, well, uh, he was two metres away, uh, the boundary umpire. Dipper, what do you think of three-quarter time? Any chance for the Cats? Well, the one that Gary is has been speaking to his players. He kept mentioning about some of the great wins they've had down here against uh, Adelaide, of course, uh, also against the Bears. He said, we can still do it. It's only about six or seven goals behind, and uh, if you have any chance for the finals, this is the side we have to beat. And uh, Gary Ayers believes that. On the other side, Stephen Kern had a lot to say to, uh, to his players and are very keen about beating the, uh, the catch as well, buddy. Thanks, Dipper. They're really playing for a genuine chance at the flag here, aren't they? 13-8 to 5-8. Start of the last quarter. Yes, for the loser, it's seventh position, and that seems an impossible position in the final eight system to win a flag from. It means you've got to win four finals in four weeks to go top. Very hard to do. You wouldn't like the odds, would you? Probably the odds are better this year than last year because it's such an even competition. If you can get on a roll, you could perhaps pinch it from seventh or eighth, but history says it's unlikely, as I said at the start of the program, Bruce. So the Cats are probably going to get two goals in the first five minutes, unanswered goals to have any hope at all here, and then maybe the body language will change out there. They certainly lifted late in that third quarter and gave themselves a hope. Ratten to Allen. Allen kicks it long into the breeze, interestingly, and Mansfield timed it well. And now called a play on and gives it to McGrath. I think this is probably their best policy from defence is to go and play on as much as possible. Kick oh. long. Up and under by Barnes. Brilliant. Yeah, he's good. Oh. He's very good. He's been there shining light up forward. Silvani and Ablett. Now to play in the pocket. And rightly so, Derek Hall just indicating that uh, Burns should have gone back and kicked the ball to the other side of the square, coming in with the win. We see a huge crowd here uh, at Cadinia Park. They can't get too many more in than that with the new seating arrangements they've got. Uh, Geelong needing very, very quick goals. Silvani has kept Ablett to one. He's got a good record on Ablett as he brings it back. Oh, good mark. Oh, I thought that was a mark to catch. I thought it deserved it. Capriani receives from Kudapitis. The crowd thought so too. McGrath at the back. Mansfield goes in hard. Heba. Gets it to Murphy. This could be... Oh, that's a free kick. That's holding the ball. Good umpiring by Brian Sheehan. That's the rule. As we see Couch driving across. Dean, too quick for Stoneham there. Dean 
Gets it to Christo, the sweeping kick. Look at this in the woods. Kernahan, he hugs it to his chest. And he will kick from 45 metres. Kernahan has kicked. Now he's getting on with it, Kernahan. There was a, as he kicks a goal, it's a one-on-one -on -one contest. And using his body beautifully down there was uh, Brenton Sanderson to out, out position Matt Clappe, the former boy from the west, the West Coast Eagles. Sanderson from uh, South Australia originally with the Sturt Footy Club. Kicks the ball outside, 50. Hannah and uh, Simpson. Hannah works it in front towards the line. Simpson with him. Over the line and out of play. 13-8 to 5-8. At three-quarter time, that was the score. Every minute here is vital for Geelong. They've got to erode this lead in a hurry. They've got the breeze at their back. They kick to the left. The breeze is probably worth about 20 metres on a kick. Brown. Back towards Heaver, has been very good today. Back to Clappe, Kernahan, Murphy clever, left foot snap, good, he's kicked his fourth. <laughs> Tremendous effort by Murphy. Heaver again involved earlier on, 5-8 to 14-8. Well, Justin Murphy, his natural ability is outstanding. He can go either side and once again, uh, Carlton just getting the ball in quickly. Kernhan just shoulders the ball forward, and I'm sure that uh, Murphy's opponent expected him to come around onto his right foot, but he double sidestepped him, went onto the left, and kicked a pretty good goal. Perhaps the seal. So, first blood of the final term to Carlton through Justin Murphy. Now, was that a throw? I think the umpire said it was, so uh, Tanner will take this ball, but. Justin Murphy has kicked four goals across that half forward line. Heaver's kicked three. Kernahan two. Bradley two. So Grant Tanner, they need three or four quick ones. Here's Barnes, all oh, uncontested. I don't think, uh, well, virtually uncontested. I don't think David Park going to be too impressed with that. So John Barnes, they really do need this kick to go through the middle. He'll kick from 46 metres. Not a bad looking kick. It's a goal. Just what they needed. So there's eight down. I wouldn't think they could win the game, but let's hope for the sake of the game that they can kick three or four quick ones. Well, Carlton are playing very well, but you just get the feeling that Geelong are the sort of side that could uh, kick four or five in a row. They've done it over the last decade, even when Malcolm Blight was coaching them. They had some unbelievable victories uh, in the last quarter. Had a few losses, of course. But, uh, well, it'll be a great finish if Geelong are in the hunt with, uh, in 20 minutes' time. 6 8, 14 8, Colbert, Brown, terrific game, high ball. Katz, Riccardi, and also Stein for the little indecision. Well done, Riccardi. He's tried very hard in the second half. Onto the boot, Sexton's been a star for Carlton all day. Inside to another star in Brown, to Murphy. Well done, Brewer. Made the effort, built the ball out of play. And Mel Hanna just uh, limping off the ground. we we'll get a report from Dipper uh, pretty shortly. Still eight goals the margin. They're all important now, any, any little injuries, because uh, they won't play a great part in this game, but next week could be vital. Allen at the back, Brewer trapped it well. Runs through the centre, kicks to Burns and Diolio and Hall to get involved. Sexton at the back, bad luck. Burns onto it, still Burns, still Burns. Left foot snap. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> he is a star, this kid. He has that intangible quality that probably a half a dozen players at any one time in the comp have got. Yes, and uh, some people say the word begins with A, other people say it begins with C, and uh, he's just a classic player, Ronnie Burns. He's only in his first year of AFL football, and he should be on the ground at all times. So back we go to the centre, a slight sniff here for Geelong. They're down by seven after that sensational goal by Burns. Is that a free kick? The Ratton number said no. Look at the oh, look at the tackle by Fraser. Oh, he's done it. He's done his shoulder, his AC joint, Jared. Look, I've got a job uh, for you. Colbert. You picked that in one. I reckon. Look at that. He's hurt. 
as he was tackled by Fraser Brown very severely. Let's hope it's not. Maybe let's see the tackle. Look at this. And is he up and about? Oh, he's come good. So I won't be officially therapy. So I'm trying to get your job. <laughs> Camperiali down towards half forward. Trying to get away with it, Geelong. Here's McGrath. Now Mansfield. Oh, Brown's tough as nails as he crashes his way through the pack again. Gee, does he want the ball? And the umpire will come by Piper, will come in and bounce. What's the report down there, Dipper? It's a slightly twisted ankle from Mill Hammer. It's uh, more of a, uh, a precaution uh, at this time of the game. He did miss uh, most of the first half of the season with that crook ankle, so uh, a little bit weak, you would think. Manton tried to get it down. The toughness of Ratton and Brown today can't be underestimated. Chris Sue coming through. Bouncing ball. Hanley conceded. Well done. Just a moment ago, Jared, when Geelong seven down centre square, Ratton and Brown's attack on the football was just brilliant. Well, they've been noted for their ferocity over a number of years now, and uh, I get the feeling that perhaps Fraser Brown out to prove a point. Greg Williams not in the side. And uh, if he can carry Carlton to another flag well he'll certainly write his name in the greats of the Carlton Football Club. Riccardi to centre wing, McKay ricochets away, Allen goes to ground, Couch has had a quiet one over the top sign for tries to get it through, Scholl well done held it up back to Couchy, Couchy well played to Hawking now give it to Burns this should be a goal this is how good he is. Crows just misses he is so exciting when he gets the ball. It was a good kick. 7 9 to 14 9. He was on the hardest flank to goal from. He got a push as he kicked the ball, and he's still good enough to make it close. Well, if you wanted to be uh, to view this as a coach, would you would say that the Campbell from Kowski from uh, Hawking just wasn't good enough. Ronnie Burns had to just prop uh, wait or uh, bide time a little bit. That's another metre back over his head. He and would he have been up and running straight for home and would have goal probably. Christo bends it back, not a bad kick looking for Allen. Allen, very tall man. And so when Justin Madden retires, we've got a ready made Ruckman there to take his place. Centre wing Sanderson, courage. The free kick to Dean may be here. Stiffer yes. Sanderson because it was a terrific mark. He showed a lot of courage, Sanderson, but then uh, Stoneham must have interfered with Dean in that pack. So Peter Dean. Finds Ratton. Carlton trying to slow it up here. Because Geelong, uh, they started to look a little bit dangerous. They've gone wide. The goalkeeper's uh, attempt there. And that was by Clappe. He found the umpire will throw it in. So, half forward for Carlton. They lead by seven goals. Stoneham speaking to the umpire. He wasn't too happy with that decision. Here's Hocking. Just a little fumble. Free kick for in the back. A little bit lucky, did you think, Terry? Oh, I would have thought so, Pete. Yeah. So he's got it. I thought he missed him, actually. Here's McGrath. McGrath to the half foot line. Hall competing against Sexton. This could be a mark. Christo. Rice. Dean Rice for Kernahan, and he finds him way out on centre wing, the captain. And look at that. That's good play, Dad. Not turn your back. Get on with the game, and he finds Fraser Brown. And Sexton runs on for him and can go for goal. 50 metres out, gives it all he's got to full forward. And unluckily, the slip coming from the Carlton defender and Clappe able to take the mark. Sanderson slipping. And Clappe surely now. Well, we've been saying it for two quarters, haven't we? But uh, it's just been that hint that Geelong could keep coming back, but this would distinguish any hope at all. He's got it. The every kick that Matt Clappe gets is important for him too. Just to hold his place in that team. 15-9 to 7-9. Once again, I think uh, you can put this down to the strength of the Carlton back line. And they've got a fairly interesting history this season. Hannah has missed uh, most of the first half, although he's playing on the wing and not so much the back line. But uh, certainly McKay has uh, just gradually got a little bit better. Chris Do's back in form and Dean also back. Eight goals is the margin as the umpire calls for a new ball. Umpire Brian Sheehan receives. 
There's John Barnes. What about the work of uh, Sexton across the back Tremendous line? Tremendous Sexton, and uh, he's had a great year. And uh, very, very reliable play. And now look at that back line. It's all those players from their premiership uh, back line. They've got them all, all together. So it'll be hard to beat again. Heaver has been terrific. Down towards the half forward line. Taken by Mansfield. I still think he's a better player in defence, Mansfield. So it's good to see him back down there. Markers by Craig Scholl. Let's see what the Cats can do. Here's Brewer. Now they've got the running players here. Brewer drives it out here towards Stoneham. Or over the back, Silvani. And takes a safe mark on his chest. Ablett's, oh, he just can't get into it. Silvani to half back, big fly. Allen at the back. McGrath flew early, and Allen is showing a lot of good signs here today. Free kick going forward to Manson. 15-9 to 7-9. No, back to Adam. Gary Abbott, you're right, Matt. He just can't get into the competition almost. It's like he's uh, just at the wrong place at the... Well, at the wrong place at the uh, right time or whatever you want to work it out. But he's uncompetitive today, unfortunately, for Geelong. The kick to centre wing. Hocking goes to ground. He's lucky to not get pinged there. Again, Carlton, Kudafidis traditionally brilliant to Rice, to Kernahan, well played. Great kick. And Kudafidis' his ability to take the ball in one hand and break a line and create a half a chance was uh, perfectly illustrated there. Kernahan goes back and it's close, I think he's got it. No, he liked it, it's a behind though. 2-2 two -two to Kernahan, Carlton still well on top. 15-10 to 7-9. <laughs> a good camera shot. Steve Kernahan not happy with himself, but uh, he's a great champion. And he's handling, runs around him and drives out towards the halfback like Kuda Beatties. Oh, couldn't mark. Allen. Quick hand pass. Hall. Kuda Beatties goes back to try and make amends. Allen again. Chris Du. Oh, runs into a brick wall. Do you know Owen Burns? What's this? Burns, Diolio, still Burns in the allow. Oh, good battle that was, fantastic as they kids kicked by Diolio out to centre wing. Is that in the full? It is, as it came off Simpson's boot. It's taken by Dean Rice. Rice to Heber. They've got the loose man going. The chip pass comes in to Kerner and who puts the arms out and takes the mark. And again, he gets on with the game quickly. Oh, that is sensational play by Kernahan. Didn't turn his back and got the pass in the Murphy. 11 marks, Steve Kernahan. So, although he's not kicking heaps of goals, I'll tell you what, his presence up there and he's giving the ball off. He has done a lot of work uh, up on that half forward line, though, despite yep. starting in the in uh, deep in the forward line, generally the square. Most of his marks have been up on the 50. Uh, Justin Murphy will kick for goal number five. He stabs at goal. Kick it to goal. Well, an exciting month coming up for uh, Justin Murphy. He's uh, been at the top uh, very briefly. He had a couple of good games for Richmond and he's had a couple of important games also for Carlton this season. But really, his career could blossom in the next month. Center. 16 10 to 7 9. Brewer tries to go through Murphy with five goals. Christo having his best match of the season. I know that's a big statement, but uh, I would doubt if he's played a better game. He's probably got a few mates here today who are probably playing at their top two. Yeah. Brown. He's played well, Brown. To Allen. The votes will be hard to give today. They'll all go for Carlton. few suggestions being written down left, right and centre. <laughs> Not as hard as I thought. Sexton to Manton. Centre went Brown coming off, Hickmon on. Brown's had a wonderful match. 12 kicks, 10 handballs, Brown. Lots of tackles. Kick by Manton to half four. Kernahan, 12 marks. Goes forward again. Wants Heaver. Mansfield's front spot is hard to beat from there, Mansfield. Plays it on quickly. Riccardi. Centre wing, Colbert and McKay. Colbert caught. 
wants the boundary line and finds it. And disappointingly for the Cats, outscored completely in the second term with the breeze, and again in this final quarter, they've been outscored so far with the breeze at their back. They haven't won one quarter here today so far. Simpson's high ball to half forward. Hall and Sexton pushes away. The bounce back to Hall. Clappe to run at him. Well played, Clappe. Hall, McKay pushing forward. Still Carlton are in there. McKay tries to push it away from Colbert. And again a bounce. Umpire Brian Sheen will bounce. Lee Colbert, I really do think he didn't hurt that shoulder when earlier. He's it's hanging limply. So it'll be interesting to see when it cools down after the game if there is an injury. Bradley, Tanner, a fresh air shot. Hall gets in a quick hand pass. Socket away by Tanner to Hocking. Hocking the half forward to Scholl and he's found him. He'll have to kick 50 metres. He wants to give it up. He's got Brewer if he wants to. He's got Ablett going back. Ablett and Silvani, a good kick. Oh, that's a goal, I think, to Scholl. Yes, he's kicked two. Well, only Brad Scholl would know whether he was actually shooting a goal or not uh, that time, but as well shepherded through by Gary Ablett in the finish. Buddha Hocking just getting his kick in. So Geelong... Uh, well, they can't win this game, but if they can finish off on a relatively good note with three or four goals, they'll perhaps get some uh, confidence out of it for, for next week. But once again, with Geelong finishing seventh, this final series is going to be so unpredictable. 8, 9, 16, 10. Tanner out of the centre. Cats go forward. Oh, good effort there. A ten and a half forward by Scholl. Right. The give from Graham to Cole, but he's kicked another one. Two goals in a minute. Geelong, 9-9, Carlton, 16 goals, 10. Well, I reckon Ben Graham's handball was a throw, but uh, nevertheless, it was a pretty good goal and passage of play by Geelong. I think Wally Lewis would have been pretty pleased with that one. Geelong making a late surge. 9-9 to 16-10. Couple of goals in a minute for the Cats. Let's see if they can go on with it. Barnes. Ratton. Ratton couldn't get his boot to it. He bores in again after it. Hocking tackles him. And up by Brian Sheehan will come in and bounce it again. There's Gary Hockey. He's had 16 kicks, three marks, six handballs. There he is, charging in after it again, but again, it'll be a bounce. He always gives 100% uh, hocking, a tough little bloke. So let's see if they can clear it out of this uh, centre bounce. Allen and Barnes. Well, Barnes cleverly tapped it down. Kuda, foodies. <laughs> He is sensational to watch on the left foot. He gets it out in the direction of Manton, but it beats all the players over the line. And when he's got that unusual style of grabbing it in one hand and then like a racehorse, he sprints clear. He's terrific to watch. He's got that acceleration, which is yeah. fantastic, isn't it? He's a powerful man too. Barnes at the back. Clappe to Murphy. Back to Rice. Just a defensive side of centre wing. Measures a kick to Kudafidis. Brilliant mark. He's having a big match, Kuda. They want it long. He's coming across the ground. Camparelli, short one again on. He's got a couple of choices. Kernahan, well done, Hanley. It was a slow ball, though, by Camparelli. And out of play at right half forward. Riccardi just giving Clappe one to go on with. So Carlton are safe and sound. They're home 16 10, 9 9. They'll finish fifth tonight. And Geelong will be seventh. So Carlton will play the fourth team in the first final round, and Geelong will play the second team. Tap by Allen. Hocking, still getting some touches. Rice underneath it with Simpson. Rice timed it much better. Took a good mark. Gives it off to Bradley. Bradley straightens the body. Kicks to full forward. Manton a target. Couple of flies. Mansell's handball. Made it tough for Hanley. Kernahan. It's a throw, I think, is it? Against Carlton. Stoneham... Uh, 
Unhappy was a free kick going to Mansfield, is it? So, semantic climax there. And the Geelong players calling for 50. Right against uh, Kernahan having the kick. Mansfield back to hocking the one two. She's looked pretty good handball to Murray. So, McGrath goes to hocking. Hocking, oh, it's an up and under kick. Set his teammate up there's uh, Craig Bradley at hurry kick to the half forward line taken by Mansfield. He dummies and then oh he's going now he's coming back onto his preferred foot, the left foot. Drives it to the centre of the ground. McCarty sets himself. Simpson is there also. Well played by Sanderson. On the Tanner, on the Brewer. Now Riccardi. Abbott's calling for it. He's one out. He's on the lead now, but he's gonna have a shot, Peter. What was he doing? Goodness me, Riccardi. He got in, he got to 50, he could have belted at a goal. I don't know who it was meant for. I think that's, uh, I thought you may be being a little bit harsh on Ablett before, but his supply has been very poor today. There hasn't been one occasion where he's let out and the ball has hit him on the chest, a la Stephen Kernhan at the other end. Yeah, I, I know it's the same, but even so, I think Silvani's had him covered, Jerry. Yeah. Chris Two's kick. It's that balance between how many times he's presented himself and how many times he's exactly, given the yeah. chance. But uh, he doesn't look as confident on Silvani as on other players, does he? Well, even the greatest players have off days, don't they? I mean, that, that's, that's a case here. Oh, I saw Jared Healy even one day have an off day. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. Hickmont. Clapper, you must have been looking very hard. He's a, he's a harsh judge, though, Macca. Well, he had an off day. Greg Williams was out that day, Brucey. <laughs> Another bounce. Macca, you can say what you like about Jared, but he's one of the only three friends you got in the world. I saw it in the paper during the week. Oh. <laughs> 42 Didn't point I margin. put you in? <laughs> I've got a long name. I couldn't print it. Allen. Bradley. Tanner. Brewer. Couch. Not going very far the ball at the moment. Back to Brewer. Tries to get around Camparelli. McKay takes the sting off it. Bradley. Camparelli. That's symbolic of this match, isn't it? But Geelong had about five goes and got nowhere. Sexton. Wonderful game to Allen inside. Big fella's been all right. That one held up by Stoneham. Back to Manson. I thought his first half was terrific. Back to Allen. Hocking pushes oh. forward. Well done. King pushes forward. Diulio. Couch. Oh, he got a corky up. Corky. Back to Burns. Burns 48 metres out. Another great kick. Just misses. 2-2 to Burns. He's... he's Effort today and his contribution has been, I think, much greater than two goals too. He's been Geelong's best player. Paul Couch will be sore after the game. I reckon he copped a corky there. Oh, he did. No doubt about it. Here's Christou. So, Ange Christou from the halfback area. Whoop, they go as he brings it up in the air to the centre wing. Dean is there. Barnes. Is that a mark? Umpire said no. Hickmott kicks to the centre of the ground. Here comes Sexton. G's been good. Here he goes again on the left foot. He drives to the open space. Kernahan had let out. Steinford, will he take it through? Yes, he will. He didn't muck around the young fella because Kutafidis was right in his hammer. Well, he'll certainly learn something playing on Kutafidis, running around after him. He's such an athlete. We see Handley bring it in. And McGrath has tried very, very hard. Tim McGrath, not a bad left foot kick normally. Tanner. Thumped away Allen because he's such a tall player, came over the top. So it'll be a throw in on centre wing with two and a half minutes left in this game. Seven goal margin. Madden started on Barnes, Allen uh, doing most of the work in the second half. Probably all of it when I think back. Hocking, Camparelli. Kicks the ball to centre half forward to Kernahan, he just waits for the bounce. Manton and Stoner. Manton pushes forward, Murphy with five goals, has another chance, coming back, probably could have gone onto his left, Rice running away from the goal, short, not good, cut off by Mansfield, can rebound here, kicks the ball on to Burns and Diolio, good mark Ronnie, pushes to Sexton, arguably the best man on the ground, Sexton, to Bradley who was uh, excellent in the first half, Kicks to half forward, Murphy worked underneath it by McGrath, who takes a good mark in the end. And McGrath chips away to half back. The sting's gone out of the game. Tanner takes the mark at 16 11 to 9 11. Grant Tanner, the rifleman, because of his uh, resemblance to Chuck Connors. Oh, good mark, Allen. Well, the umpire's down, Brian Sheehan. Now, someone, someone 
promised to Kennan into him accidentally. Brian Sheehan, that's happened to Brian Sheehan a couple of times in recent years. Now, I don't know what happened. He's obviously, unless he's indisposed in some way. But let's see what happened. Umpire crash. Allen, oh yeah, big Allen crashed into him. Matthew Allen. And a bit of a mismatch in size here, Jared. And Sheen, he's a tough little bloke. He'll get up and about. He's only got a minute and a half to go. There he is, Brian Sheen. Well, he's pretty fortunate uh, that he could get up because if Ellen had have hit him flush, it may well have been uh, curtains for him for the afternoon. It's a big difference between being running fit to and combat fit, isn't it? There is. <laughs> Sexton, short to Bradley. So Bradley at uh, half forward, between half forward and wing. Big stats today, good game. Two big goals in there for the Blues. He's been one of their great players over the years. Back to Sexton, just uh, eating away the time now, the Blues. Sexton's figures are big too. 13 and 15, back to Heaver. Heaver's contribution was important. To Sexton, it's like a soccer match, the way they're pushing it around. And he kicked it out of the fall. Mrs. Bradley. So the Cat fans at least have got a little bit to be cheerful about. Hawkins got it at half back. I guess Hocking and Barnes are the other two, along with Burns, who've been there. They're good players, haven't they? Hocking's gone all day. Well, Barnes is perhaps the big positive for the Cats. He uh, was out last week, and he's come back in. He's in pretty good form. McGrath back from Hocking. McGrath kicks to half forward. Free kick to Mansfield. He'll come back. So we're inside the last minute now. Well and truly. And the Cats. Barnes, Bradley, play on court. Couch. High ball to full forward. Carlton with the numbers. And I think fittingly Sexton's going to take the last mark of the match. The last important play of the game. Off to Allen. Allen kicks it wide. And there's a sign. And Carlton did do the Cats on the dinner today. They were far superior. 16-11 to 9-11. And the repercussions, Jared Healy, for this match are large, aren't they? One team jumps to fifth, one falls to seventh. And also, I think the repercussions will be felt uh, in the first week of the finals because Geelong's still a very good uh, team. They could uh, well run over the side they place. Uh, but down the boundary line, we've got Robert Dippy Domenico. Thanks very much, uh, Jared. Uh, terrific uh, game, Kurt. It looks like the, the Blue Boys are back in September action. Yeah, we thought this is a finals game, so we took it pretty serious today. And to win at Cadenia Park, you know, amongst all the Geelong crowd was fantastic for us. It's been a long season for Carlton, and obviously a great season last year, and a few injuries this year, but, uh, you know, September just around the corner, and the right players are playing well. Yeah, it's been a tough year for us, you know, after winning grand final, you expect that. Everyone comes out pretty hard against you, but, you know, we're looking forward to the finals for sure. And before you came out, I thought the boys were really pumped up. Uh, same uh, sort of uh, feeling before the grand final last year, I thought. Yeah, no doubt. You know, we came out here obviously to win the game, and we did, and just fantastic even by the boys. Right. Right. You get used to the girls, don't worry, mate. All right, <laughs> go for it, buddy. Well, the fans were out on the ground early there, weren't they? Yeah, interesting. After uh, the actions uh, against Fitzroy, the Black Bombers not uh, applying any resistance or tackling uh, whatsoever. So uh, beating the second siren there, Kudafidi's talking to uh, the big Dipper. It's a great win by the Blues. And Dipper said, you'll get used to the girls, Kuda, don't you worry. When all the girls were flocking around, well, how would Dipper know? Well, you'd know all about that. Oh, I don't. <laughs> Terrific win to the Blues. Yep. They've still got a chance, haven't they? I think had they finished seventh, you'd say no hope, Carlton. Gee, there Should... were some good signs for them, Brisbane. And they've got their full back line together. That great back line, probably as good as any in the league. Probably them with West Coast. Probably the swap is uh, uh, Diulio for Whitehead at the moment. That's probably the only change. But Six. getting Dean back in, one of the yeah. great generals. He's played the last two games in a row now. And uh, you just saw him intercept one that was going to stone him. But his great pace came in and created a goal down at the other end. They're a big chance to Blues now. Perhaps there's a change in the ranks. Perhaps Dean's still a very valuable colonel. I think Sexton might be the new general. He is. And Silvani back there too. It's 9-11 to 16-11.
getting through the pack. This is a great... Final scores here, Carlton 16-11, Geelong 9-11, so the Cats did win the final term. The only one that won for the uh, whole match. Burns I thought was very good, Cole got a lot of touches up forward, wasted a couple but they both got two. Barnes, Colbert, Ablett, McGrath and Mansfield, and five for Murphy and three for Heaver. Kernahan was excellent, Bradley excellent, Ratten terrific, Clape, Diulio and Kudafidis had a big match. So, Gerard, a uh, seven-goal win, arguably Carlton's uh, best performance of the year, if not the best, one of the best, and now they've got a chance of playing a major role in the final series as we take a look at some of the second-half highlights. Yes, uh, great pluses for Carlton in uh, Justin Murphy and I think Brent Heaver, eight goals between them. They're going to need them to uh, fire in the next few weeks because uh, Stephen Kernan is no longer the, uh, the match or any winner he was. He needs some support, and we see Justin Murphy... He's brilliant on both sides of the body. He's got so much talent that one day he'll, uh, he will turn it on and perhaps it'll be in the next month. And wouldn't that be a, a coup for Carlton to, for their, one of their first-year recruits to come in and uh, dominate so much? What a great mark to Stephen Kernhan. Once again, not big uh, return on the scoreboard, but his marking across the full forward line and in particular the half forward line was a real key to Carlton. I think they actually played the ground better than Geelong today. They're, their uh, use of the ball from half back through the centre, the long kick to a leading Kernahan was uh, exemplary, and he also had some support uh, in his younger, in his uh, smaller players coming through and kicking the goals. But I agree with you, Bruce. Uh, Ronnie Burns, a, a great player, I was uh, staggered actually. He wasn't on the ground when we first got here. And I think if they had the game again, Geelong, they would probably reverse their decision, uh, which was, I would assume, made on Thursday to start uh, the three big guns in the full forward line into the wind, basically out of the play for the first half of the game. And I just think that uh, they've got to follow the current trend in football, and that is to have your best players across the half-back line and attack from there. But you can understand their rationale. Ablett uh, appears right at this stage of his career unable to be a lone hand in the forward line. He needs some support, but uh, not at the expense of both Mansfield and of course uh, their co-captain in Stone across the back line. Sexton was terrific. Brown and Rat in their hardness in the centre square along with Bradley's class and finesse. That's up to something substantial. Uh, Sexton just the run across uh, half back. Dean you mentioned McKay getting a bit better. Silvani the back line's in place. Suddenly Jerk. They're a real chance, aren't they, Carlton? Well, the only one that you'd say they're missing uh, from last year is Greg Williams. I mean, mm. he was uh, brilliant. Norm Smith medalist last season. But uh, 
They've also got a couple of pluses, as we just described, with mm. uh, Justin Murphy. But if you look at uh, their season, Carlton, they've been up and down, but Brown is back now. He's had that in and out with a hammy. Hannah's uh, missed the first half of the season with that ankle and slowly, after a few games, getting back to his best. Brilliant in the first half, I thought. McKay, whilst you think he like, looks like a rusty bicycle, I wouldn't mind him having, in, mm. having him in my rack. And Dean, the general, and Christo was the real big plus today. Mm. He was just fantastic. Mm. His best game for so long. What about the votes? Uh, I guess Carlton 3-2-1. They were. Uh, I gave three to Ma Michael Sexton. He is, uh, if not the best centre-half back in the business at the present time, at least his equal. Uh, Ange Christou, his best game for the season. I think that's uh, a fair comment. And Justin Murphy's five goal warrants him a vote. I thought uh, John Barnes a little bit stiff. So they're the 3 2 1 for the uh, Sports World Player of the Year. What about the play of the year? The one play, the goal of Zeulio. This really got us all excited, didn't it, in the uh, second quarter? Christo to himself. Let's count the possessions. Well, there's one, and Bradley gets involved a couple of times. There's Hannah, who you talked about, uh, Jared. There's two, three. Silvani's piercing handball to Camper and his little give to Bradley. Changes his mind. Little one to Kernahan. All their good players involved, Diulio, Bradley will get back involved in a moment with run, lovely vision to Brown, Diulio finishes it off, oh fantastic wasn't it? I think it was about nine, I, I lost count through the middle of the ground, it was, uh, it was a brilliant play and as I said at the time I think it, uh, the benefits of that sort of play is more than just six points, it just lifts the whole side, everybody almost got involved. In a sentence, do you think they could still go back to back? Come? No, doubt. no doubt about it. You do? It. Yeah. They've got a chance, okay. And Geelong? I think they can't win it now. I think that Geelong have blown their chances, but by golly, I wouldn't like to be coming up against them in any week of the finals. Fair enough. OK, uh, so Carlton have really made some ground here today and Geelong have lost quite a considerable amount. But uh, they'll sting back next week and it'll be a big game. They can't afford to lose one from here on in. OK, let's have a look at the, the other matches today. It was a very important game of Victoria Park. Last quarter highlights coming up. Collingwood were leading at three-quarter time by a couple of goals over Brisbane. They're not enough off the bench. Ahmed. Long kick with the breeze, the down in front, a little bit of a push, champion at the back, Williams, Watson, goes and down, oh, he's got it! That player's looking good! The short one is on, it bounces across the goal face, McIver gets by Francis and turns it over directly to Liddell. Liddell can go short, one of two, Watson has to wait, crashing in there, champion, and Watson, unshakable. Watson, marvellous kick. That should sew it up. Watson's third. See if he can get a few more games next year. Hasn't played too many. Boss. Oh, only ran into Russell. Lappin has had better days. Then again, a few of his teammates, we could say the same. Robbins to Clark. And the big Ruckman, what can he do with it? Certainly been one of their best players today. Champion the target. Couldn't mark it. This is Ashcroft. He goes at goal from 15 metres out and he's put it through. Not like his game, as we've mentioned. Liddell, been very productive. And Scotty Russell, well, he's had a real ball burster. Lipic missed it. Watson doesn't. He comes in and he kicks his fourth. Tossed in. Hotton knocks it down. Burns, Crow inside the 50, working in a confined space, Liddell in the pocket. Yes. Well, what a goal. <laughs> what an afternoon the young man's had. Armat reaches over the top, Francis in there, throws a boot at the ball, connected. Watson playing with great confidence to Wilde, pulls it back, Williams open goal. Have a look at this. Not good signs for Brisbane on the eve of the finals. They've lost their top position. Collingwood kicking seven goals in the last quarter to one. Watson got four, Williams four, Pitt two, Francis two, and Liddell two. So not a good sign for the Bears. The other game today had uh, no impact at all on the final series. Playing for a bit of pride out at Waverley Park. The Saints were well in front at three-quarter time. Last quarter highlights and Kilda Adelaide. At ground level. He's got great vision to Brown. He can go very, very short. In fact, it was McLaren to Brown. So Tony Brown, you asked the question before, Drew, is anyone playing on him? And big Everett again, just puts up those big arms. You've got the answer. The nearest man is Chris McDermott. So Everett hasn't had his kicking boot on today. Four goals, seven. Oh. 
but he has split the centre, so he's kicked his fifth goal. When did they kick 41, Drew? Uh, it's testing the memory, I'll say, in about 78. Against who? Oh, I can't remember. Who kicked the most points on that day? Smith runs into the open goal for St Kilda and bangs it through. Work to the back by Vitovic. Terrific by Jones to Harvey. Robert Harvey gets a goal. Matthew Young for St Kilda. Keeps it in. They want more, the Saints. Lappin certainly wants more. What a boys player he is for such a youngster. The kick by Lappin. Everett. Well, he's had a day out, Everett. 12 marks, 13 marks he's taken. And kicking across the breeze. It's right to left. Gee, that's a beautiful kick. <laughs> Is it there? Well, he's kicked all the hard ones. Gives it to Zilla. Running on his Shanahan. He's never kicked a goal. He won't be close enough. Wonderful pass to Stewie Lowe. Never a goal in league footy. In fact, he doesn't even know what the goal post looked like. Stewie Lowe's pumped it through. He's kicked 90 goals for the season. This is a magnificent end for St Kilda. And a great one for Stan. Everett finished with seven goals, Lowe four, so Lowe finished the season with uh, 90 goals. Modra got four for Adelaide, he finished with 75, that's a terrible story for the Crows. 20 goals, 24 to 11, 9. Adelaide has won four out of its last 18 matches this year. They were top of the table after round four, 4-0, four they finished with just eight wins, 144 to 75. So Robert Shaw's last game as coach for the Crows, not a happy one at all. Dipper's down uh, stairs, Dipper a terrific uh, result for today, uh, much uh, in the wash-up from uh, both clubs? Well, unfortunately for uh, Aaron Lord, he's got a uh, hip injury and looks like he's going to struggle to make it up uh, for next week, as we saw him come off the ground a quarter time there. And uh, with Carlton, we've got uh, Mill Hanna with that slight uh, ankle problem, as Jerry mentioned, uh, prior to the season. He uh, uh, did hurt himself and has been struggling to get back. So that's about all. No reports. And of course, uh, when you hang around, uh, could have feed us to see what happens. Yeah, all the yeah. river chase you, you know. Uh, Diver, Kuda, Kuda says the same thing about you, Diver. I'm he, sorry? Kuda, Kuda Fidi says the same thing about you when no, he hears Hey, Diver, just Bruce. very quickly, do you think Carlton, what chance Carlton very quickly? Do you think well, they can go on? Well, after today's effort, Bruce, you've got to put them in the top, uh, you know, two or three teams who can make that, uh, you know, uh, grand final because the experience plays a long way in, in finals. And Brisbane's bad loss today won't help them either. I'm Good sorry. on you, Diver. Thanks, Bruce. That's okay, mate. I'll let you. have got your hands full there. I can see that. We'll take a break. We'll be back with more after this.
Well, the ladder will change uh, quite a bit because of today. Brisbane top, but they can't stay there. Either Sydney or West Coast will go above them. North Melbourne could even finish top on this uh, strange weekend. Carlton, one thing for sure, they'll be fifth. Essen and Geelong, and either Richmond or Hawthorne, depending on the results over the weekend. The AFL centenary season, proudly brought to you by Mitsubishi Motors Australia, Qantas, the Australian airline, Foster's Lager, Mobile, Nike, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's. Jared, Saturday night footies in town with two games tonight, one in Sydney. Uh... It's uh, West Coast up against the Swans and then at the MCG also Melbourne playing Hawthorne which has a, a bizarre element to it, not only Hawthorne trying to play in the eight because of all the merger talk. How do you see Sydney West Coast? Well I guess the, uh, the variable there is Tony Lockett. Let's say he does play, we'd well, think that it's going to be a very tight game and I would almost favour Sydney if Lockett plays and is fit. If he doesn't play, well I think West Coast will probably uh, take that one out and tonight uh, at the MCG I think Hawthorne will do it pretty easily. Fitzroy's last game tomorrow, Fremantle will obviously favoured against them, so a sad time for Fitzroy's supporters. And Richmond North just briefly? Well, I think it's going to be a tight one. I, uh, I've tipped uh, Richmond in that one, but uh, North a great side. And so much depends on tonight, doesn't it? I mean, if Hawthorne happened to lose and Richmond suddenly are freed up and they're much more relaxed and all of that. But either way, there's a lot to play for tomorrow, particularly for North Melbourne. If Hawthorne lost tonight, Richmond would be in the eight, but North then could improve their position. So it's a fantastic finale to what's been an excellent season so far. And today, Cadinia Park, Carlton made its move by winning by 42 points over Geelong. Good afternoon. Seven Sports Production.